So today we're going to be talking about uh, shifting the plastic pollution narrative um, by holding corporations accountable and reclaiming zero waste. And I'll kick it over to Melissa. Hal, thanks so much for joining our session. Um, we're really excited to, to share more with you about these two kind of topics that are um, strung together um, across this idea of shifting the narrative. So really shifting the stories that um, either we've been told by um, industry or the stories that we're seeing out on social media. Um, so to share a little bit about the work that Breakthrough From Plastic does, uh, Breakthrough From Plastic is a global movement working to um, end plastic pollution. So building a future free from plastic pollution. Since um, we launched back in 2016, and since then we have more than 11,000 organizations and individual supporters from around the world who have joined the movement to demand massive reductions in single-use plastics and to push for lasting systemic solutions to address the plastic pollution crisis. Um, member, organiza ind member organizations and individuals share the common values of environmental protection, social justice, and work together through a holistic approach in order to bring about that systemic change. Um, and that means tackling plastic pollution across the whole plastics value chain. So not just looking at um, end of life, but really looking at um, extraction, manufacturing, um, all the way to disposal and focusing on prevention rather than cure um, and providing effective solutions. And really that prevention rather than cure is really um, key to a lot of the work that we do here in Breakthrough from Plastic. Um, do you want to introduce yourself, Sybil? Sure. Um, so I'm Sybil. <laughs> um, I'm based in just outside Washington, D.C. in Northern Virginia um, in Nacostin lands. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and Melissa and I are both with Break Food from Plastic. Um, and I get to focus my energy on um, our, our project called the Brand Audit Project, where we work on holding corporations accountable for the plastic pollution crisis that they are responsible for producing. Um, I just I did just want to say that since our session is in English and we want to just be mindful um, that it might not be everyone's first language. Um, if you um, are more comfortable with uh, English, French, or Arabic, I'm happy to try to answer questions. And Melissa is also uh, fluent in Spanish. So um, let us know in the chat. Um, and yeah, over to you, Melissa. Thank you. Um, thanks, Sybil. And uh, my name is Melissa Aguayo. I'm the member engagement officer for Break Free From Plastic US. So we have a small coordination team um, in the US made up of myself um, and uh, two other folks. Um, and then later today, we'll also get to hear from um, two of our core members and panelists, um, Rosie and Shashanda, and we'll introduce them um, at the second half of this session here. So thank you for, I see Rosie, thank you for joining us. Um, and just to go over um, a little bit of, of housekeeping, uh, this oh, session sorry, Melissa, is- real quick. Sorry, yeah. before we do housekeeping, um, can everyone uh, just take a moment to uh, introduce yourself in the chat? Um, we just wanted to tell you who we are, but we really love to know who, who you are as well. Um, sorry for, <laughs> I should have gotten to that, Melissa. Um, so please just let us know your name, your preferred pronouns, um, and where you are. Um, encourage you to include uh, the native lands on which you live, and I'll drop a link in the chat if you're not familiar. This is a great moment to, uh, to learn. So um, just want to yeah, make sure that you all have space. We wish we could meet you in person, but this is the closest we can do right now. Okay, thanks, Melissa. <laughs> Sorry for that. No, no, no worries. Thank you, Sybil. And I'm uh, in the um, unceded land of uh, Tongva Nation um, in Southern California. Um, but yes, um, so some, some quick housekeeping. Um, we, um, this session is being recorded. So if you are not comfortable sharing your image or voice publicly, um, please keep your camera off and or rename yourself on Zoom. So that's one way to, to do that. Um, and then there's also closed captioning available um, for folks who um, would like to use that. And um, that's in the, actually, I'm not seeing that. Do you see that? <laughs> I'm hoping that our PowerShift team can, can support with that. And if anybody has any any questions about that, um, but so excited to see we have people from all over uh, North Carolina, Redondo Beach, not too far from where I am, um, Seattle and the Duwamish land, love it. Nice. Hey Jude, good to see you on here. 
Welcome, everybody. Love it. All right. Well, hopefully our PowerShift uh, tech team can support with the uh, closed captions. Um, and at any time throughout this presentation, we can keep it relatively informal. Please use the chat as your space to drop any questions or comments, uh, and we'll have a lot of space um, towards the second part for uh, hopefully some good some good discussion. So um, this is this is your session. Make sure to uh, stop us at any time. Um, okay, so to kick us off, um, uh, we'll start with um, just a little background into the plastic pollution crisis. Um, it's many different <laughs> terrifying facets um, and uh, and uh, the source where uh, where we can really uh, turn to um, to understand this problem. And then we'll uh, go over to my colleague Melissa, who will be sharing the mic with some awesome organizers who are really leading the way with uh, solutions. Um, so uh, as a quick little icebreaker to uh, further get to know one another and kind of understand where we're all at with our um, kind of understanding right now with regards to plastic pollution, I invite you to uh, take part in a short activity with us. We're gonna use Mentimeter. So um, you should be able to just go straight to the link in the chat that I just dropped um, to share the first three words that come to mind when you hear plastic pollution. What's the first thing that you think of when you think of plastic pollution? Um, is that link working for folks? Yes? Okay, great. You can alternatively go to menti.com and enter the code you see on the screen, 96913168, but I think the link should be easier. So um, go ahead and drop a star in the chat once you're done uh, submitting, and then we'll see in a couple seconds um, via a handy dandy word cloud um, what our associations are, which is pretty cool. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren, David, Megan, Megan, Joe, Leonila. Give folks about 30 more seconds. All right, so check this out. Can folks see the word cloud that is growing before our eyes? Yeah. So seeing a lot of ocean packaging, waste, microplastics. Yes. Some environmental justice, oil. Oil. Yeah. Gross, yes, <laughs> definitely gross. Abundant, overwhelming, <laughs> absolutely. Forever, big soda, gas. Yeah, cool, very cool. Um, nice. Is anyone surprised by what you see? Is this like kind of what you were expecting? Um, I think it's. I think it's really critical that we see ocean seems to be really taking the biggest uh <laughs> the biggest space in this um some folks seem to not be that surprised um yeah it's about what we were expecting right so that's why we're here that's what we really want to talk about um today in this uh workshop session so um for for a, quite a number of years now um plastic pollution really has been uh, described as an ocean issue, as a marine pollution issue, as an ocean litter problem. Um, a lot of the images that um, often come to mind for people are images like this top photo of the turtle um, in the plastic packaging. You might have seen, um, you know, images of birds wrapped in plastic bags or, um, you know, dolphins or whales with plastic bags in their stomachs. Um, and this is very much a real uh, tragedy. Um, plastic pollution in the oceans is definitely 
um, a heartbreaking, uh, urgent crisis. Um, and it is very important to recognize that images like this one of marine life strangled by plastics uh, has been very effective at really sounding the alarm for many people. Um, it kind of fires up that part of our emotional uh, compass that, that gets upset at um, innocent, you know, innocent creatures being, uh, being abused, being taken advantage of. However, I want to also encourage us to think about um, the other faces of plastic pollution because um, plastic pollution is so much more than an ocean uh, pollution problem alone. Um, the photo at the bottom of the slide here is um, a group known as the Louisiana Bucket Brigade. Um, they are based in uh, St. James Parish, Louisiana. So shout out to um, where Power Shift was supposed to take place, um, really in the heart of what we call Cancer Alley in the US. Um, the name Cancer Alley really uh, emerged because this is the heart of the US petrochemical corridor um, where the majority of uh, the oil and gas and petrochemical industry has um, expanded um, and has really um, caused uh, disproportionately uh, large toxic uh, health and environmental impacts um, on uh, low income communities, frontline communities, communities of color primarily. Um, and so um, even just last month, like this has been an issue for a very long time, but it's finally gaining uh, the prominence and focus and attention it deserves. Um, and even just last month, a United Nations human rights expert um, denounced uh, this project that's being uh, built out in St. James Parish, the Formosa Plastics um, uh, Company. Uh, they have a proposed $12 billion project um, to uh, make plastics. Um, uh, and, and this UN human rights expert has denounced this project as a form of environmental racism. Um, so environmental racism really is um, a huge part of the plastic pollution crisis. Um, and this too is plastic pollution. So we're really gonna um, explore that together um, today. So um, hopefully next time you fill out a word cloud, this will also come to mind as uh, one of the many um, faces of plastic pollution. Um, and it's worth kind of starting off by looking at this um, plastic pollution life cycle uh, image together, um, because if we see the bottom here, so it starts top left and it flows around down here. Um, the the image at the top that you saw, the the turtle, um, you know, wrapped up in plastics, and a lot of the images that might often come to mind when we first think of plastic pollution is focused at this last stage of the plastic pollution life cycle, at the stage of dumping, burning uh, plastic as waste, plastic in the environment, in the oceans, in our rivers and, and communities. Um, and that is a very uh, important and a very real part of the plastic pollution story, but it's not the full story. To really tell the full story, we really have to look at the full life cycle, which starts from the moment the oil and gas is extracted from the wellhead. So um, maybe you maybe didn't even know this coming into the session, but I will not let you leave without knowing <laughs> that 99% of plastics are made from fossil fuels. Um, so plastic is pollution from the moment the raw materials are extracted from the wellhead. And plastic continues to cause different kinds of pollution at every single stage along its life cycle. So from extraction all the way to disposal, we have pollution of different kinds um, that uh, are really, really detrimental um, disproportionately onto uh, marginalized communities. Um, and so let's unpack that a little bit together. Um, a few of the basics, um, if, you, if you are leaving this session with, uh, with anything, this is the slide I hope you take away with you. Um, bless you, Melissa. Um, so uh, feel free to take a screenshot, tweet it, um, save this information, uh, but please, 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 this is the essential slide from my section of, of this workshop anyway. So number one, you have to know that plastic is made from fossil fuels, primarily fracked natural gas here in the US. 
And so plastic pollution is an integral part of the climate crisis, okay? Number two, plastic pollution is a social justice issue that disproportionately impacts uh, marginalized communities, not just here in the US, but in the global south. Um, when China um, a few years ago decided to stop accepting uh, exported plastic waste from the rest of the world, including the US, uh, the US has started shipping its plastic waste um, to other global south countries, um, particularly in Southeast Asia that do not have the infrastructure to deal with this. So oftentimes it is incinerated um, and uh, really causes uh, big problems in um, countries like Vietnam, Indonesia. Um, so it's a social justice issue um, in a very big way. Third, <laughs> hopefully you've heard that recycling is really not the solution many of us grew up thinking that it was. Um, most plastic recycling is actually what we call downcycling, where it is not turned into a product of equal value, but if you're lucky, a product of lesser value um, because of the chemical composition of plastic and the way the polymers break down and erode um, each time it goes through the recycling process. Um, but we'll come back to that. And lastly, um, what we really need is systemic change. So I'm sure as folks at PowerShift, you're hearing this surely in other sessions as well, um, that what we need is really structural change. Um, and for that, a big part is we need companies um, to redesign the way they deliver their products to people to really shift away from our reliance on uh, plastic, particularly single use plastic. So, to kind of uh, look in a little bit more detail at that plastic pollution uh, life cycle uh, image we saw earlier. Um, let's start at the beginning of the plastic pollution story, shall we? Um, so number one, we start with extraction. So 99% um, of plastics uh, made from fossil fuels, which um, we know risks oil spills and groundwater contamination and uh, if we were to listen to the science, um, this really means keeping fossil fuels in the ground if we have any chance at avoiding the catastrophic impacts of climate change. So again, uh, remembering uh, the physical location of Louisiana where PowerShift um, was supposed to be held in person, you can see um, on, the, on the slide on the left side, this is um, Texas and Louisiana, the heart of the uh, petrochemical industry where um, it's just a spider web of oil and gas um, facilities, production sites, um, huge, huge, huge emissions and toxic fumes and health impacts for those living near these facilities. If anyone in this group um, lives near a, uh, an extraction site, let us know in the chat. Uh, feel free to share your story. Um, and um, yeah, so this is an image from Frack Tracker. Check them out if you want to learn more. Um, the next stage, of course, is production. So you can see on the left, a resident from uh, St. James Parish, Louisiana, uh, where folks with um, uh, the Louisiana Bucket Brigade and, and other great organizers um, are trying to push back against uh, Formosa Plastics. I'll actually drop a link in the chat if you wanna um, help them fight Formosa Plastics. Um, but a, a thing that I really wanted to um, emphasize at the production stage is that um, the production of plastics also is part of the emissions problem that contributes to, uh, to climate change, right? So, um, What's shocking is that given so much more that we know about the problems with plastic now, um, it's even more concerning that um, the industry is still uh, projected to grow quite dramatically between now and 2050. Um, and the graphic on the slide here shows that um, if growth in plastic production, as well as incineration, um, continue as predicted, their cumulative greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 will essentially take up 10 to 13% of the total remaining carbon budget. So really important to keep in mind that the production stage as well as incineration at the end, um, very, very 
uh, emissions heavy and contribute to um, our limited carbon budgets. Um, shout out to Lauren for um, sharing her story, um, living in Houston. Yeah, it's the real epicenter of the industry. Um, sorry to hear about asthma. It's an unfortunate reality for many, many people living on the front lines. Um, so let me just take a moment now to um, share if you want after this workshop to um, support a group that is doing awesome work, grassroots group on the front lines. Um, here is um, something to check out to support those <laughs> trying to stand up to um, the industry um, in Louisiana. So do check it out when you can. Um, the next stage, consumption. And I know for me personally, this is the stage that really freaks me out because um, a lot of us um, might not necessarily uh, live directly next to a petrochemical plant or near a fossil fuel pipeline. Um, so for, for a lot of us, just average people um, in this session perhaps, um, it's, it's this stage where we have an intimate, <laughs> tangible interaction with, uh, with plastic, right? Every time we um, go to the grocery store, um, we often don't really have much of a choice. Um, most of what we eat or drink comes packaged in plastics. And what's really crazy is that um, a lot of our food, bottled water, ends up with microplastics um, in it. <laughs> so um, not just seafood, um, but bottled water, beer, um, all sorts of scientific uh, studies have been um, increasingly finding microplastics in our bodies. Um, and some really shocking research came out last month um, by Professor Shanna Swan looking at how um, plastics, microplastics, and the chemicals in microplastics um, are not just entering our bodies, but um, entering uh, pregnant women's fetuses and being passed on to um, the unborn and is really impacting um, everyone's fertility. Male, female fertility is really at a huge decline. Um, so won't get into that in too much detail, but if you're interested, look up Dr. Shanna Swan. Um, and on average, um, scientists have been uh, sounding the alarm that through ingestion as well as inhalation, because microplastics are also in the very air that we breathe, uh, we consume about a credit card's worth of microplastics every week. Um, for a long time, scientists didn't really know how this would impact human health, but with Shanna Swan's research, we're starting to learn that um, it's not good to no one's surprise. It is not a good situation. Um, and of course, last but not least, at the stage of uh, disposal, an estimated 8 million tons of plastic waste enters the oceans every year, um, and only 9% of all plastics ever discarded since the 1950s has actually been recycled. Yes, A. Matthew, also microfibers from clothes when you wash your clothes. So much of the fashion industry has a plastic problem as well. Um, and when we wash our clothes, microplastics shed um, uh, and enter the, the water systems. Um, and of course, as plastic lies in landfills or washed up um, on beaches or in the environment, it releases methane and ethylene, which are greenhouse gases known to exacerbate climate change. Um, so from the very beginning until the very end, we have um, different kinds of pollution um, to human health, to the environment, to marine life um, at every stage along the way. Um, I just stop you really quickly. Um, yeah. Lauren in the chat was wondering if you could repeat the, um, the microfiber stat again. Was that the one, Lauren? Feel free to unmute as well. Is it the credit card? I think it was like some, a certain percent gets recycled each year. It might've been right before microfibers. I just missed that. Maybe yeah. I just didn't hear it because it was so ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, um, maybe you don't want to hear it. You don't want to believe it. Um, <laughs> I, I know I felt that way. Um, yeah, the stat um, on recycling is of all plastic ever produced since the 1950s, only 9% has been recycled. Um, so that's globally since the 1950s. Um, you can look at then like country to country, you know, per year. 
yeah, holy crap is right. Um, so that's 9% globally since the 1950s. So, um, so on this topic of, of recycling, we really have to beware of false solutions and greenwashing. Um, I also had a holy crap moment when I first learned about this because you know, I thought recycling was the magic solution to, to the waste problem. Um, but a lot of uh, great research and work has been done to really explore uh, the reality of the situation. Um, so just last year, a super comprehensive uh, survey conducted by Greenpeace of all US-based material recovery facilities found that essentially in the US, only plastics one and two can legitimately be labeled as recyclable because uh, they are the only ones actually recycled currently in the US. Plastics three through seven are very low quality um, and cannot really be recycled for um, chemical and economic reasons. Um, so there are a lot of different greenwashing attempts out there. What we mean by greenwashing is essentially uh, when a company um, is, tries to paint themselves as being environmentally sustainable, um, essentially as a marketing ploy in order to sell you something very often <laughs> or create a good reputation for themselves when really um, they engage in um, very dubious <laughs> uh, practices that are not good for the environment. So uh, what we're really seeing from a lot of big companies is that um, emphasizing recycling has now become sadly a form of greenwashing uh, because it's enabling the perpetuation um, of the single use model rather than um, addressing the, the source of the problem, which is um, the overproduction at the source. Um, so uh, many different kinds of greenwashing out there. I wanna make sure that I leave time for our activity and my colleague Melissa's section, um, but needless to say, um, a uh, awesome group called Changing Markets um, published a report last year called Talking Trash in which they break down the three essential tactics that the plastic industry uses to promote false solutions, AKA greenwashing. Um, that is number one, pushing for voluntary commitments, which means they can, make nice sounding commitments, but then not ever follow through with them. Um, number two, distract from their role at the heart of the crisis. So a big way they do that is by pushing uh, for individual responsibility. It's, it's individual's fault for not recycling well or, or um, littering on the ground, um, really deflecting blame onto individuals rather than uh, the corporations that produce the plastic in the first place. Um, and three, derailing legislation um, by lobbying against real solutions like refill and reuse systems or extended producer responsibility in which the producer or the polluter pays. So uh, at Break Free From Plastic, we're really focusing on real solutions. Um, and at the heart of our work is um, what we call turning off the tap. So if you imagine uh, a bathtub where someone has left the faucet open, um, the first thing we would do to stop the flood is to turn off the tap, not mop the water on the ground while the tap is still open and flowing. And that's really what we need to do with plastics as well. So um, the, the solutions that we focus on are really to reveal um, how much companies are really producing. Um, number two, pressure them through policy work, legislation, et cetera, to reduce how much they produce. And number three, to redesign the way companies deliver their products to people to eliminate our reliance on single use period um, and to shift towards alternative delivery systems, uh, refill and reuse systems, et cetera. And so um, one way that we're doing that with Break Free From Plastic um, is through a citizen science initiative called Brand Audits. And this is what I work on at Break Free From Plastic. Um, this is a people powered tool where um, volunteers, community groups, or even individuals um, record data on the plastic waste they find at a cleanup, um, recording specifically the branded information on that waste. Um, and this is a way for us to kind of change the story we've been told about who's really responsible. So we conduct these brand audits um, all around the world. We've been doing this for a few years in a row. Um, and it's a very simple tactic that helps activist, activists everywhere to shift the focus of accountability and responsibility 
um, onto the corporations that produce this plastic waste in the first place. Um, and I love this question in the chat. Can we do this anytime we want? Yes, and we're gonna do it right now, actually. Um, so um, we have, how much time do we have left? Yeah, like five minutes, five, 10 minutes in our yeah. section. Okay, perfect. So we'll do breakout groups for five minutes um, and then we'll come back for five and share the results of everyone's brand audits. Um, and I hope that our tech support can support us for- I have, I have host abilities to do it now, so yeah. Okay, awesome, great. So um, let me just drop the activity sheet in the chat. Access to it, so you have to share it to everyone. Yes. So if folks could click on the link, um, make sure you have it open. And then what we're going to do is Melissa will put everyone randomly into five groups. Um, so when you see like you've been placed into breakout group two, then you click on group two, click here. Um, so each group, what you'll find is um, a one page um, activity. So you'll have some instructions. Um, please have someone uh, volunteer to read the instructions out loud. And then you will conduct a virtual brand audit. So you'll find a virtual plastic waste pile and you'll be looking to record the uh, branded waste information in a little table. Um, and then we'll report back what you learned and who your top polluter is, okay? Um, and Melissa and I will try to jump into your different breakout groups to make sure everyone's doing okay. Um, Does anyone have any questions before we send y'all to your breakout groups? We're, we're essentially trying to simulate what a brand audit would be like in um, a virtual setting, so. Cool, okay. Next, next best thing. <laughs> All right, then here we go. Okay, have fun everyone. See you back here in five. Okay, looks like there's two like people. Most, most people, yeah. Maybe we want to pause the recording right now. Come back. I think that was probably a bit rushed. Sorry. Um, I hope you got a little bit of your brand audit in. Um, so I think folks are still coming back. Um, all right, let's hear from uh, group one. Who was your top polluter? Feel free to unmute or use it. Or maybe just or... like a, a reflection because I don't know if everyone got to complete the, the assignment. So maybe just like a, yeah. um, a reflection of, because of, I, I heard some interesting reflections as people were, were doing the exercise. Sure. We kind of had two top polluters because they had the same amount. I guess if you're going on count, uh, Unilever and Nestle, because we had a lot of Lipton tea bottles and Nescafe wrappers. Yeah. Right on. Awesome job, group one. Uh, what about group two? Any reflections or learnings about your top polluter? For um, us, our top polluter was uh, Kraft Foods. And uh, I don't know if we have any like reflections on it, at least from my side, um, we were kind of <laughs> rushed for time, but we know that that was definitely the one that had the most. Yeah, right on. Sorry, friends. <laughs> um, you got a packed agenda for the second half. So it's like, we got to kind of wrap this up, but this was just to give you an idea. Um, how about group three? What did you, uh, what did you find in any reflections? Okay, I think that our biggest was Coca-Cola, although we haven't gotten to all of them. So there might be like two that were both from the same parent company. And I feel like that was one of our big takeaways was how many brands were associated with each parent company who we weren't, it makes it complicated, but also maybe easier to target specific brands if they're 
so responsible for so much plastic waste. Yes, well said. <laughs> um, it's shocking, right? Looking at that chart and seeing how we have this illusion of choice, but it's really just a small handful of big corporations that own all of these brands. Um, awesome, thanks for that comment. How about group four? Our top polluter was PepsiCo, um, having like 10 separate bags of Cheetos. Um, and that was a little bit of a coincidence because Isha and I were both in that breakout room and we were both um, currently leading a campaign against PepsiCo on our campus, the pouring rights contract. <laughs> so just thought that was interesting to share, but, but yeah, so we weren't surprised here. <laughs> Fascinating. It was meant to be. Um, <laughs> that's super, super interesting. Um, would love to hear more about your camp campaign in the chat. And uh, last but not least, group five, what did you find? Um, our top polluter was Unilever. We had a lot of Skippy peanut butter jars, which I thought was really interesting because I actually did not even know that Unilever owned Skippy. So that was new for me. <laughs> Right? Yeah. I think that's a big kind of a learning moment when you realize, oh, crap. <laughs> Sorry. I'm having a technical glitch here. Um, yeah, that it's really just a small handful of, of kind of companies that uh, uh, dominate the market. Um, sorry, friends. I have too many tabs open. Um, <laughs> thanks for your patience. Here we go. Um, so sorry. Where were we? Um, uh, yeah, so anyway, congratulations on completing your uh, first brand audit. Um, based on uh, kind of what you saw reflecting uh, the trends that we've seen globally, these are the top 10 polluting companies that we've been finding in our global brand audits from the last three years. And you can see uh, the top five are what you found, um, more or less Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, Nestle. Um, so you can learn more about um, the details of, of this activity and what we're doing to hold these companies accountable in our brand audit reports. Um, and it's really very crucial that we focus on the companies because they have huge budgets, they have huge uh, research and design teams, and they have the uh, capacity to redesign the way that they deliver their products to shift away from packaging. And um, just last couple of slides before we wrap up and, and head over to uh, Melissa and, and our speakers. Um, this is really important because the majority of the plastic produced every year is single use plastic packaging for uh, packaged food and beverages. Um, looking at this, this handy dandy little graph here um, that shows you that. Um, number two, production is projected to significantly increase. So, um, you know, as bad as the problem already is, it is projected to get significantly worse unless we act now. And um, the plastic, plastic production is really the fossil fuel industry's plan B as um, more industry and more inventions are coming out that are trying to shift away from our reliance on fossil fuels growth of electric vehicles, et cetera. They're really banking on plastics to be their kind of um, plan B to continue uh, making money. Um, and uh, at this rate, um, we're looking at about 8% of the world's oil production being used to make plastic. And that figure is projected to grow to 20% by 2050. So um, on a closing note um, to kind of wrap up, <laughs> These top polluting companies you can see on the right side of this graphic. This is from a brand new report that just came out last month. And then looking to the left, you can see the direct link towards the oil industry that sources to these intermediate uh, plastic uh, packaging companies that then sell to our fast moving consumer goods companies, the Unilevers, Coca-Cola companies and McDonald's of the world. Um, so there really is a direct link between fossil fuels and plastic packaging. Um, and uh, on that note, it's not all doom and gloom because Melissa and our awesome speakers are gonna tell you more about solutions. Um, and if you want to really join this movement and help us uh, end the plastic pollution crisis, the climate crisis that is deeply embedded, 
I'll uh, invite you all to join our movements. Um, and I hope to stay in touch and see you all soon. Over to you, Melissa. Thanks so much, Sybil. Um, I'm just gonna quickly do some little tech things here. So give me 30 seconds, y'all. I'm gonna look for my speakers here. My screen, people. While Melissa is getting set up, um, check out the link in the chat um, to join us at Break Free. And if anyone has any uh, questions or um, further comments, wants to stay in touch, feel free to email. Greg, could I trouble you to start your video so I can spotlight you for? I, I'd love to. The camera's not working, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, I'm going to remove spotlight for us as well then. So we're not um, just, so we'll have it be a little bit of a, we'll do the speaker version here. Um, and I'll share my screen. All right. All right, well, hello everybody. Um, Thank you so much for, for again, for, for joining our session. Um, I'm excited to share with you a little bit. Can y'all see my screen okay? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, I'm excited to share with you um, uh, our session, our second part of the session, which is um, reclaiming zero waste. And um, what I mean by that is um, really shifting the narrative around what we're thinking about when we're talking about zero waste. Um, I know a lot of the times when I've had conversations with, with other individuals, um, they get really discouraged because they're like, oh, I'll never be able to go zero waste, or it really puts the onus on the individual, or we go on social media and we look at pictures of of, um, you know, people's waste fitting in a mason jar and it just feels so unattainable and maybe we don't even see ourselves represented in that. Um, I know for, for me, um, I grew up not thinking of myself as an environmentalist or conservation um, conservationist. I'm a first generation Mexican American. My, my parents immigrated here from Mexico and a lot of the things that we practiced were conservation, were environmental practices. Um, we just didn't necessarily know to call it that. And you know, we have like the, the running joke where if you opened up the, the yogurt container in my mom's fridge, you more than likely were not gonna find yogurt, but in fact, we're gonna find things like beans or rice or some sort of leftovers. Um, so a lot of those, um, you know, being really resourceful and, and all of that was just a part of our culture. It was just embedded into the way that we did things. Um, so uh, the the this session is really looking at reclaiming zero waste and really shifting the way that we think about zero waste practices and the way that we talk about zero waste and really making space and uplifting the communities um, and, and cultures that have practiced this for a long, long time. Um, so Today, um, we get to hear directly from Rosie Torres with um, Society of Native Nations. She's one of their board members, is also um, a dancer, and um, she, she'll tell you all, all about the work that she's doing with um, Society of Native Nations and, and kind of that indigenous perspective, right, which I think are the, the original zero wasters. Um, she asked me, she shared these two pictures with me, and I had to pick one, and I couldn't because they're both so cool, so I had to go with both. <laughs> and we'll also get to hear from Greg Sautel with um, South Baltimore Land trust um, who's doing incredible work um, a lot of the times you're all, you know you hear about these impacted communities and and how hard they're hit and all of that is true but there's also incredible wisdom and expertise and solutions that are coming from those communities um, so Greg is going to tell us a little bit about the work that they're doing um, towards a just transition and how they're building that zero waste community um, how they defeated an incinerator and the work that came after um, so without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing here. I'll share a little bit more um, in a little bit. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to kick it over to um, Rosie first and then Greg to do a little um, self-introduction. And then we'll move into some questions. And then, of course, we're also um, would love to hear questions from you also. Please, if you have any questions, um, you can type them in the chat. All right, Rosie. Hello and greetings from uh, Yanawana Somi Sec territories in also known as San Antonio, Texas, uh, Texas. Uh, we are uh, central south of, of the great 
state of Texas. Um, I am from the border, from a border town uh, known as Laredo, Texas and Nuevo Laredo, Tamaulipas, Mexico. So I feel like I have always been championed to uh, be a guardian and a steward of, of the river that was always so polluted in my neighborhood and all the creeks that ran into that uh, grand mighty Rio Grande. And flash forward it to um, many, many years later, I am a dance educator and dance artist and dance choreographer. That is my career. That is my chosen path for work. And so um, I've been able to travel throughout many parts of the United States as well as internationally um, teaching dance. And then through that movement, through the flow of uh, being a representative of movement, I learned about my native background. Um, and I've been a danzante for Calpulia Yolopazzi here in San Antonio. Uh, and we, um, as well as I am a board member with Society of Native Nations uh, based out of San Antonio. And along with my relatives, we uh, work in communities like the one I'm sitting in right now which is another one of my jobs, is at Galeria Eva uh, Gallery. Uh, it's an art gallery, and uh, the artist um, named Veronica Castillo Salas is the master of sculpturalist of ceramic. She works with earth clay. As you can see behind me, we just finished this yesterday. It's a small little um, room that's going to be called the Cave of Knowledge or the Cueva de Sabiduría. It's a uh, a small place for a library here in our um, south side neighborhood, which has very little bookstores and has very little for the community to share in spoken word or just conversations about Mother Earth and all that we champion for environmental justice and social justice, especially for the communities and people of color and the LGBTQ community as well. And so there's so much that I do and I hope that that kind of um, wrap that up in a bubble but i'm here to speak to you on behalf of society of native nations and one of the projects that we've been um doing and working and and uh, participating and sharing is called Return to the Earth and Mold It in Spanish is Volver a la Tierra y Moldeándola um, and so we are um, so honored to work with a master, Veronica Castillo Salas, who is a master ceramist and sculpturalist of the Trees of Life. She's a fourth generation artist of the Trees of Life from Puebla, Mexico. And her family has been working with the four elements, um, water, earth, fire, and air, um, and uh, sculpting, right? But with Society of Native Nations during COVID, we wanted something for our families to be able to find a safe space where they can congregate outside of their home. And as you can see those photos, images, uh, we have created plates, um, cups, bowls, and any other um, homeware that we can sculpt or make with our hands so that we can stop using plastic um, cups, plastic plates, uh, plastic utensils. And um, we wanted to give our families and especially our youth the ability to create something and take home and be proud of because also within just making and sculpting there's art right so we get to actually paint whatever is in your mind whatever you need to um what you have in your creative juices and so we, we take those home and they last for a long time and you don't have to be buying stuff and it also allows you to be more patient and and um, intentional about how you use your plate not being so wasteful right so washing your plate with care and or just taking care of it how you place it in the pantry to store your plates and how you drink from your cups and and so those that program is still ongoing and we have been able to um, work with about 40 families now um, and we're hoping to keep this going because the, the, everyone loved it and we have some children who are ready to come back and uh, mold and sculpt and um, also because we have some native relatives of the central and south Texas communities we're also able to sculpt and make ceremonial uh, tools that are um, helpful for us in our rituals as we you know unite with taking care of Mother Earth 
I'm sorry I'm outside and so you hear all the ruckus of the cars and and the helicopter uh, and stuff. Um, I'm also Yanawana River, which is also known as the San Antonio River. It's just a few blocks from here. And so we have beautiful um, feathered relatives that come visit us all the time. But that in a nutshell is our program here in San Antonio, Return to the Earth and Mold It. And um, uh, just to say that we also have our own gardens. We um, have been as a community sharing the seeds. And so it's also great to share the foods that we have created with our own hands and raised in those plates that we've created. And uh, just together as a community, helping each other, support each other that way has been a really beautiful eye-opening experience on how we can together mold um, the, our vision to creating less plastic waste. That's all I have. I love that. Thank you so much, Rosie. I, I love the multi-generational approach and just how there's value in the things you're creating. And, and if it were to break, it would just go right back into the earth, right? Which is, it's true. Um, it's true. Yes. It's um, something like if it were to break, you could put it back together or you could give it back to the earth and regrow some plants because it's just, it's that, it's the earth and so it's beautiful if you have an opportunity to work with ceramics you're using four elements the water um, is used to soften up the clay and uh, the ceramics that you're making um, the earth is obviously the earth clay the wind is your breath you have to breathe into your movement right so if you were to just roll something like this you can't just work on it really fast you breathe into it and the fire is obviously the kiln and the oven and so that's a really beautiful connection as well with mother earth and so many so many themes and, and topics there um all right to, to kick it over to you greg um we'd love to hear a little bit about the work that you're doing um in the south baltimore land trust um and working with the community there uh to to work towards a just transition and also want to give a, a, a huge thank you to greg who stepped in for our um previous speaker who had a family emergency so thank you so much for joining us greg of course thanks melissa and it's good to be here with everybody uh, so I'm Greg Sautel with the South Baltimore Community Land Trust, uh, which as our name tells you, we're in, uh, in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, and specifically we're rooted uh, in communities in far South Baltimore, uh, Curtis Bay, primarily where the origins of our organization, our land trust uh, can be traced. About 10 years ago, uh, when myself and Shashanda, who was then a high school student um, and a group of other students came together, uh, I was, a community partner, uh, the high school at the time was facing threat of being of being closed, um, and it was undergoing a, a transition because of austerity measures and and decisions, policy decisions that said entire communities don't really need places of public education. Um, so it survived that threat, and over a, a sort of transition period, there was this response by the community to come together and actually generate programming and, and sort of have community solutions to going through a process to rediscover and reinvent what this school could be in the context of, of South Baltimore neighborhoods. Um, and so one of the things that emerged that, that Shashanda and myself and Destiny Watford and other amazing youth leaders were a part of was developing <clears throat> a group that could simply come together around some, some basic ideas of human rights, um, rights of the planet, rights of communities to sustain conversations about what our actual ideas were about the places that we lived in, the places that we worked, um, and to really start asking some basic questions. And uh, a very long story short is what came out of that was learning about a major development proposal, uh, which none of us knew about, but we're learning about just through sort of opening our eyes to the world around us. And that was the plan to build the nation's largest trash incinerator less than a mile away from the school that we were all sitting in. Um, <clears throat> And we were learning about the development years after all the relevant decisions had already been made. Um, and that ranged from the state of Maryland itself at a policy level, um, redefining what renewable energy was to accommodate this new development. And it was this particular company, it's a New York based company that had donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to literally change the meaning of words uh, in the state of Maryland to allow burning trash uh, to become a renewable energy source, just like wind and solar and receive millions of dollars in public subsidies. And what we learned next was as a result of that choice that the public school system itself and 20 other 
public entities, art museums, places of culture uh, were locked into contracts to purchase energy from this incinerator. And that was really the way they were gonna finance this development. The nation's largest incinerator was gonna be financed by selling quote, renewable energy to public schools whose mission is to safeguard the health and the future of the next generation for our society to, to continue to, to develop. And so we learned about these shocking contradictions and we learned that an entire narrative and story had been built to literally breathe life into this toxic polluting development. And what we realized our strength was, and we learned this pretty early on, was by starting another conversation. And initially that was a year of just learning about it and really understanding what we were, what we were up against. And there were defining moments where students decided to, to really make this a priority and a focus, not really knowing what that would lead to or what it could mean, what power we could build. Uh, but eventually it led outside of the school to really talk to, to neighbors and, and other community members. And that's when we started to learn about the deeper history of the place that we were in, where there were entire generations that had been uprooted by similar stories of large chemical manufacturers or wartime industry literally displacing entire neighborhoods. Um, and some of those residents who, were, who used to live nearby on waterfront land that had been cleared out to make way for polluting developments, including this new incinerator, would tell us you know, what seemed like bleak messages of any hope of combating this is going to fail because we've lived through this and we've been displaced. And while initially that was jarring, as we learned about the history and became friends with this older generation, we realized that there was, there was a lot to learn and a lot of, to, to, to come out of intergenerational uh, relationship building. And some of those folks that initially maybe slammed the door in our faces came to be strong parts of this, of this multi-year effort uh, and campaign, which was ultimately successful in defeating that proposal and largely what the way we were able to build power was finding a way to sustain through our own creativity, our own voice, storytelling, music, art, was by telling a completely different narrative, which was that the community has, we have a vision. We have a vision for what came to, to be zero waste. We didn't know that phrase or that term, but we found out what it was through first learning what it wasn't, which is continuing to impose the back end of this system that we heard about when we did our brand audits just now, which is about extraction, overconsumption, subsidizing, polluting industry, <clears throat> and then at the back end, using entire communities as dumping grounds, uh, counting on bases of people, workers and communities, uh, not joining together and challenging these developments and ultimately building a base that's capable of developing alternatives. Um, and I'll never forget a community meeting, I'm going to wrap up here, but a community meeting where our city council person who was then in favor of this development, but not in an incredibly vocal way, kind of learned what was going on, that there were actual young people in the neighborhood knocking on doors and starting conversations about what was being developed on land in the community. And he, and he said, why are these students out here talking to their neighbors? What are they saying to each other? And there was this thick feeling of this fundamental distrust but what we learned and we talked about within the group is it posed a real threat. The simple act of people coming together and talking over a period of a year and then two years and three years was really enough to destabilize the sense of security that this system had. And it was used to just walk through, roll through a development process. Now, ultimately, as we defeated that proposal, that same council person emerged as one of the strongest champions of the zero waste movement in Baltimore. And so in so many cases where we've had direct confrontations with people that have been caught up in this system that compromises so many of our values, um, many of our best moments have been those when we've been able to, through sustained dialogue and collaboration, but challenging one another, we've been able to actually build relationships that have been instrumental in the power that we've been able to create. Um, so that's an introduction. Now we're working on, on the actual implementing the actual transition uh, a wave. We still have incineration in Baltimore. We defeated that. There's still an existing incinerator, a medical waste incinerator, and a large municipal landfill. Uh, we're working on a sequential process where we can phase out reliance on those facilities. Um, and as a community land trust, one of our uh, central to our mission is actual community land ownership of spaces in the neighborhood uh, so that residents themselves can govern uh, and actually make choices. And, and, and learn together as we build alternatives on the very land in the neighborhood that's been sacrificed for so long. Wow, that is 
so inspiring and and such a such an amazing story thank you so much for sharing greg i think that there are lots of um threads there that kind of relate to some of the things that rosie was talking about as well with like that that multi-generational um uh, effort and campaign um and and how sometimes there's there's even pushback there right and how we have to to work together and find that common knowledge and um and those community solutions. Um, so this is a this is a question for you both. Um, pardon my slack noises. Um, this is a, a question for you both. Um, how do we, as as individuals or local com communities, tap into that knowledge and those solutions that exist within our communities? How do we connect to um, maybe the the value of traditional ec ecological knowledge? Or um, just that, the, as, as you mentioned, Greg, um, there was some just some of the lived experiences that were also were helpful and, and also sometimes not. Um, how can you tap into that community knowledge? I know you touched on community, just having conversations, um, but I'm curious if, if y'all could build on that. Um, Rosie, since you have your camera off, maybe you want to take it first. Sure, thank you. Um... So I know that a few years ago, I started um, this journey into being more vocal and uh, a stronger advocate and showing my support, not just vocally, but physically um, to help save the water. Uh, again, I talked to you about how many years ago I, I grew up in the border town, right? And the pollution in the water was damaging all of us. The river was being contaminated by uh, what's called maquiladoras, uh, big warehouses that were um, from Sony to um, like all these new um, uh, B BCRs, VHS making machines. Um, that's that's what I'm talking about, like the 80s, and um, and so it just all of this waste was going into the river, and it was affecting our communities. And when I left Laredo, um, I moved into uh, to San Antonio, and I realized that there was also um, air quality that was just terrible. And so my suggestion to each one of you is look at where you are. Where do you stand? Where do you live? And what are the trees species around you? What are the plant species around you? What is native to your space? Do you have a, a sacred mountain around you? Do you have a, a wonderful river that has been and existed for so long? And are there any pollutants going into that river? Here right now in San Antonio, we have various, you know, we're a huge city. We're the seventh largest city in the United States. And we have so many levels of pollution that's happening right now. Um, we are also a military city. So we have four to five bases that continue to use and extract um, our, our resources here through water, uh, through trashing, through the jet fuel, um, and just all the, all the waste that they create and all of the, um, well, I don't want to get into that details, but um, also we have big corporations that are around us extracting giant pieces of land to help create or ways for pipelines for the ga natural gas industry, which leads right into the Gulf of Mexico. And so we're all connected, right? What is happening in your neighborhood? What, uh, what are the feathered animals that are um, being exploited right now? I'm using that word exploited, but I should probably say displaced. Uh, for example, here, the migration of some birds uh, along these beautiful parks along the river are being uh, displaced because of tourism, right? So uh, you can make a difference by learning where you're at, just like um, my colleague here said, you know, they were no, in their school, they were, the air quality wasn't good. So what is around you? Uh, and how are you acknowledging what is the living species around you? How are you responding to it? Do you know if the plant medicine that is in your garden or in your riverbed or in your mountainside or in your desert, uh, in whatever region you are in, you have plant medicines, you have earth medicine, um, and, and how are you responding to it? Do you acknowledge it? How are you listening to it? And so by listening to Mother Earth, our environment, what is here can help ripple into the bigger universe uh, and around the globe. 
And so that's how I would help you start making that difference. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Greg, over to you, same question. Yeah, and I just so much of that resonates with, it all resonates with me and just the, it brings me back to some of the early, early days when it was myself and a small group of people and, you know, taking on what felt like such a complex and big, big topic and not, you know, feeling very disoriented. And I think there's a way that um, it's very easy to feel that way. And I just looking back and I think somehow we found this together at a very basic level as a, as a, it could start with one person. In this case, it was a handful of people, but finding that trust um, and not putting that demand of understanding sort of with the, you know, the mind at every single step um, uh, and taking, a, taking a, a risk. And what I just keep coming back to is the power of narrative and storytelling. And I mean, just literally, like we would be sort of learning things from people within the school. So for example, we'd hear these, hear a story of a, a, a volleyball and basketball coach of the girls volleyball and basketball team telling us that because of the asthma rates, they literally couldn't field teams, you know, for those, for those sports. And, and us having that, of course, that it's a terrible story to hear and it's a terrible reality, but also have that feeling of uh, just trusting your body and having that feeling of chills run through you of the power of some piece of information that you've heard about and, and trusting that that's something now you have. And then as a organizer or whatever word you want to use for, for our role, when you're in a position like this, it's to, it's to find a way to then share that information, um, you know, with the larger, what becomes a collective that's, that's can be unified by, by a narrative that becomes a common narrative that we all shape and form as individuals, but we all start to carry inside of us. And so then just being a part of that, it all has to start with a trust and a belief um, and a willingness to sort of share and be committed to doing that consistently in a way that sort of grows this thing that's beyond any of the individuals. And it really can come, I think it really can come to life, um, you know, if it's done and, and that's a beautiful thing to be a part of. And I don't think there's any replacement for, for bonding with a group of people that maybe you still don't really know, you know, particularly well in a larger community when you have thousands of people, but you've all gone through something together. Um, and that gives you then a, a way to continue working together um, that's irreplaceable. So I think rather than any, I, I think that's the way you, from, from my experience, that's the way that you come to be changed by a process like this is that you open yourself up to it, but you also put yourself fully into it and, and you share what you can at any opportunity. Um, but you're open it, opened to it being a constant interplay between yourself and the environment that you're immersed in. Um, I mean, I'm not originally from, from Curtis Bay, uh, the, the, the community that I've come to spend a lot of time in. And that requires a real balance for me. And Shashanda, who you would have heard from, isn't either, but she went to school there, um, you know, and spent a lot of her formative years there. So, um, so it's, a, it's a place that we've been welcomed into and our ability to continue to work there and in other communities that we, we do live in and that are experiencing the same conditions is based on the ability to maintain that trust um, at every step. Thank you for that, Greg. I, I keep um, resonating on, on your comment of trust and belief and how that is so crucial to, to building that, that community that we need and, and, um, and linking those stories to really be able to shift the narrative, right? Like one story by itself is, is a one-off, but once you start connecting all those stories, it's like, wait, that happened to you as well. I'm also dealing with asthma. And you start linking those stories and you start to see the bigger picture that was very intentionally um, trying to be obscured by the industry narrative, right? And I think that y'all um, successfully were able to, to link those stories and, and push back on the, that industry narrative. Um, as you said, you know, getting, getting schools to fund what was actively polluting them is, is just, um, but we see it all the time. Um, so really, really amazing. Um, I could talk to you both all day long, um, but we only have a little bit of time left here. So I'm going to ask one final question um, to you both. Um, we, we 
touched a little bit on, on just transition. Um, so my, my question to you both is, what does um, a just transition actually look like in practice? And how can local communities or us as individuals, if we're feeling really inspired, which I know I am, how can we take a more active role in pushing for a just transition? Rosie, you look ready. Or any final words that you'd want to leave us with? <laughs> Uh, are we ever really ready? <laughs> um, you know, there, I wish that there was one solution like that. You're going to go to this place and you're going to, you're going to find this, this golden ticket or this thing. And it's just going to make it all work. I think it's just a constant, um, it's a constant practice. Um, because we're, you know, we are so bombarded by the consumer industry and the just, we're bombarded. And even when we don't want it, like free things come my way all the time. And I'm just like, I don't need any more clothes. I don't need any more um, tools for my dance life or th so and just kind of learning how to say stop a pause and and reevaluate or evaluating what you have and how you can balance what we are living in at this moment right to justifiably like stop consuming plastic products and find those people find the communities that um, have their own farm that are raising their own you know if you're a carnivorous person that you could find, go find the chickens that they are raising um, nearby where we go to a local farm who um, is like our meat market so we know we go buy our food there there's no they don't use plastic we use our own um, I, igloos right our own ice chest and then um if if you know our plant medicine we go to the the a few uh places that um local people they're not even businesses i mean there's just like grandmas and, and aunties and and people who just want to share uh, medicines and and i'm talking about like teas and uh things to help with diabetes and cholesterol. And so, so that we're not using the pharmaceutical industry that's also perpetrating um, so many, so much pollution. Um, and so just practicing also sharing our knowledges, right? So if I'm gonna go buy a present for a loved one, I'm gonna go find a local artist who's working with natural products or maybe natural soaps, making those soaps and, and, and paying and, and exchanging our money or exchanging our time with the, that community um, helps us stop feeding the corporate giants that are actually polluting. And so those are small steps that I have taken. I can only speak to you through my experiences um, as a dance educator, as a mover, as a lover of trees and life. And um, as an auntie, I want to be able to live in the future where we are no longer picking up trash from the river that's around here um, and helping the feathered, you know, animals with their nesting, because, you know, it's just really sad to see all the plastics that they, they create in their nests. So um, that's what I have to say, small steps you can, and talk to your, your elders. I'll help you out with that too. I love that. Thank you, Rosie. It's, I love how it was like individual solutions that, but that were all like going back to the community. Um, so yes. really building that, that um, local resilience, right, which we've seen how important that is through through the pandemic, for sure. Uh, thank you, Rosie. Um, Greg. Last yeah. Last. So yeah. So this is bringing uh, bringing me right into the moment we're in now, which is we're actually working on implementing uh, a zero waste plan that was called the Fair Development Plan for Zero Waste. It was initiated by uh, community members who were successful in ending that new incinerator proposal. Um, sort of gained some of the political buy-in needed to initiate this planning process, as there was an effort to close down the, the existing incinerator in Baltimore. Um, <clears throat> and so we created a really amazing community-driven plan centered on equity. Um, and uh, we're able to get a lot of buy-in for it. And now we're in a situation, it's been about a year or two years since we, we got the plan adopted of really working from a, a community level, but still at a citywide scale 
of, of sequentially implementing some steps. Zero waste uh, is both incredible because it's such a massive journey that we're undertaking that brings you into every aspect of our, of our lives. Uh, that can also be daunting when you're looking to how to get started and what to, to begin when a city is trying to move from such a position of dependence on burn and bury to a, 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 something that's genuinely zero waste, but also is it in, done in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that you can say we accomplished something that starts to build larger belief. Um, so for us right now, that is built, working directly with labor partners. We have a great collaboration with the Teamsters Union, and we are working uh, community and labor together as part of coalitional effort. We've identified uh, city-owned land in South Baltimore that's been used for uh, for decades. It's um, you know for for landfilling, um, but it's we're evaluating it to serve as an opportunity to develop new zero waste infrastructure, starting with getting food uh, out of the waste stream. So we're looking at our educational and institutional sectors that generate over a hundred thousand tons of food waste every year. That's either sent to the landfill, driving methane emissions, or is burned. Um, and of course, the effort is to reduce any unnecessary food waste. Um, that's, of course, within a zero waste system, what we need to, to be doing. At the same time, we need to build the alternative infrastructure so that we can heal the soil um, with organics that do end up uh, needing to be diverted. Um, and to do that at a scale that works for a city. And so, um, you know, that's what we're, we're undertaking now. And so um, it's challenging. It's exciting, though, to be at the stage where we're actually looking at new infrastructure development. And then what just transition means is, is really crucial because zero waste can get tossed around and just transition can get tossed around in, in lots of ways. And so we're really in a position of defining it um, within our coalition about what do we really mean. And we're putting ourselves in the position where we want to be imagining first, but for real, being writing uh, contract language and procurement language that's actually going to govern new contracts between those very institutions that we're going to be polluting the community by supporting this incinerator. We wanna be in the position to be authoring um, the actual framework. So we're talking about local hiring provisions um, and, and, and a whole host of things that are actually going to lift up and be real um, examples or manifestations of a just transition. Um, and that includes really grappling with the issue of what do workers do that are currently working within the burn and bury infrastructure. It's not, a, it's not a huge number of workers, but every single job is precious and is an important. Um, and so we take that very seriously. And I, I guess the only thing that, that we know to do is have a commitment, but then to always think structurally about at the end of the day, how do we embed these values and principles in the flow of resources, in the flow of, of contracting dollar and dollars and public money that we have so at the end of the day, we can see how our values are, are, are being lived out or not um, in these decisions. So um, yeah, excited to uh, keep everybody posted on that effort and hopefully we're gonna have some real, real breakthroughs in Baltimore. Yes, please. We will definitely be uh, watching the work y'all are doing and um, would love to, to share out um, your, your victories and successes as they happen. Because I think so much, um, so much to learn from the work that y'all are doing. And again, it's, it's so inspiring. So thank you for, I know it was, must've been really challenging um, figuring it out and um, doing that in, in community. So thank you for, for your work and for sharing with all of us. Um, Greg and Rosie, really, really appreciate you sharing your, your wisdom and expertise with us today. And um, I'll kick it back to Sybil um, to close this out. Thanks, Melissa, um, and thank you to our speakers. So nice to hear from, from you in uh, Texas and Maryland. Um, so as our final uh, closing activity, um, I will invite you to revisit that um, little mentee activity we did from the beginning to see how perhaps uh, folks you heard from in this presentation and maybe things you learned today uh, may change the first three words that come to mind when you think of plastic pollution. Um, so take a moment now, um, if you have time before hopping on to your next power shift uh, session to uh, share your top three words that come to mind now, as opposed to the beginning of this session. Um, and I'll share the word cloud um, in about 30 seconds so we can see if anything has changed. Um, so would love it if folks uh, could just drop their reflections in that little 
three word chart. Ah, you have already voted on this. Snap. Well, you know what? Let's do it the old fashioned way. Drop your three words directly in the chat and let's see together uh, what may have shifted for, for people. Um, in the interest of time, if folks want to just unmute themselves and say out loud, that's fine too. But um, and Melissa and I really hope that this uh, maybe exposed you to some new ways of thinking about plastic pollution and the story that the industry tells us versus the stories that um, communities on the front line and those with solutions tell us. And I hope you uh, leave today's session with hopefully um, a different story than you had when you entered it. Um, anything you want to add, Melissa? Seeing some awesome words in the chat. Thank you, everyone. Really cool to see. Yeah, I'm seeing some incredible reflections um, here. Source reduction, nice. yes. Source reduction. Disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Zero waste, producer accountability. Yes, friends. Community justice accountability, yes. Corporate monsters. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you all so much. Um, once again, um, we encourage you to to stay connected with Break Free From Plastic so you can learn more about the um, the brand audits. There is a um, I don't know if uh, you want to do your your pitch. Uh, <laughs> civil. Sure. I already shared the link in the oh, chat. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, I encourage you all to join us organize brand audits with us. There's lots of other ways to get involved. Um, check us out, breakfreefromplastic.org. Um, and I wish we could give you a big hug in person, um, but great to see all your virtual faces here. And um, yeah, let's get organized uh, together. I just threw my email Round in the, the chat if anyone uh, wants to reach out. Um, otherwise, thank you all so much. and. Looking forward to working with all of you to, to break free from plastic. And a, um, again, a, a big thanks to, to Rosie and Greg for taking the time to share their stories and expertise today.